So the US economy has a whole range of risks and fragilities. Europe, on the other hand, is actually in a serious funk. Germany's in recession. The UK is in recession. I think Italy fell into recession as well. It tells you how much economic headwinds there are in Europe in particular, but also in the transatlantic economies. Now, all of these economies interact a lot with China. And the last thing either of those actually needs is for China to suddenly experience the collapse that some of them seem to wish to happen. So I don't think it's in their interest, number one, for any economies to collapse, uh, which always makes me wonder why this rhetoric happens. And one of the reasons for that, to manage you know, population descent. After decades of incredible economic growth, China is experiencing economic headwinds. It is now transitioning into a new model of economic development. It is also dealing with Western economic and technological sabotage. China's economy, Western economy, which will be the driving force in 2024? What's the global outlook? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. Joining me today from Australia is Warwick Powell. He is an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology, senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, the founder of Smart Trade Networks. So, Warwick, thanks for joining us. Absolute pleasure, Jingjing. It's great to be with you. I'm glad we have an expert in economy like you to share with us your analysis on China's economic development model and the global outlook. So according to the latest data, China's GDP grew by 5.2% in 2023, which is in line with China's 5% goal. And meanwhile, we see so many negative projections from Western commentators, Western media, all of them are crying China's economy is collapsing, China's economy is failing. If one read Financial Times, uh, Bloomberg, of course, one may feel China's economy is dying. But what's your thought on China's economy and how to understand China's economic transition to a new model? Yeah, look, I think the first thing to, in a sense, come to grips with is um, trying to understand what's behind these sort of China collapse narratives. And I must say, I'm often a little bit confused as to why uh, these Western media outlets insist on this when, if it was true, if it seems like their grand wish came true, then uh, the economies that they hold dear would go down the drain as well. And... So it's not actually in anybody's interests for major economies in the world to um, collapse, of course, but to suffer headwinds for a long time. The fact that Europe's in recession is actually no good for anybody. It's, of course, no good for Europeans, but it's no good for anybody who exports and does trade with Europe as a whole. Now, that's just one example. To understand China's economy, you sort of have to take a long view because in many ways there's an obsession in the daily press to talk about daily events without understanding what's happening at a structural level. So for the past 40 years, China's economy has transitioned through some key phases of its modernization experience, starting from reform in agriculture and small township economies, transitioning into small-scale, simple manufacturers, attracting foreign direct investment, and transforming manufacturing into an export powerhouse, focusing very, very much on China's historic competitive advantage in low-labour cost, high-volume manufacturers. So what China was for a long time was an economy that imported raw materials and exported low-cost, high-volume manufacturers. At the same time, come, say, 20 years ago, China began a very significant two-decade program, in effect, of industrialization plus urbanization. And 
those two drivers worked in tandem because as populations urbanised, they also supported the creation of a domestic economy that would demand the things that the manufacturing sector would make and continue to add domestic demand impetus to support growing industry. And you see that in the manufacturing data. So in 1995, China contributed about 5% of, um, of global manufacturing. It's now 29% of global value added. And in terms of exports, Chinese manufacturing uh, went from exporting about 11% um, back then, rising up to about 18% in 2004, and slowly coming back to about 13% a couple of years ago with the latest data. So what that story tells us, Jing Jing, is that the economy has grown its manufacturing capacity. It tremendously expanded its export potential. And then the domestic economy started to grow to create new drivers of demand. So that's where things have gotten to. We've had this massive surge in urbanization, which was coupled with a number of things. One was significant investment in public infrastructure that connected people to places through telecommunications infrastructure so that you can move information through electrical in infrastructure so that you could use things and um, have a higher standard of living and operate machinery and transportation infrastructure that could enable goods and services and people to move from A to B. What happened then was that as we hit the 2010s, the property industry started to become heavily leveraged domestically. We saw the explosion in about 2013, 2014 of the shadow banking industry, as well as the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms that absorbed a lot of people's investments, but actually didn't end up doing anything productive. And this leverage situation reached a point where by 2017, the then governor of the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, was actually talking about risks of a Minsky moment. What he was talking about was the, the, a phase in the credit cycle uh, described by an American economist, Hyman Minsky, where over leverage ultimately led to financial crisis because the real economy could actually not sustain the repayments of the loans. So we saw that in the West in 2007, 2008. In many ways, it had, had its Minsky moment. And the People's Bank of China governor was concerned in 2017 that this was a real risk. Not surprisingly, at the same time, President Xi Jinping actually sent a very, very clear signal to the market about these concerns when he said that housing is for living in, not for speculation. So it was very clear that the regulators and government was concerned that credit in housing was really getting too hot. It was getting carried away. It also had other implications, and that is that when one sector attracts so much of national resources, it means that other sectors don't have access to those resources, whether it's capital or human labour or natural resources, you know, uh, the inputs that the building industry was using, steel and concrete and all those sorts of things, was being sucked into the property industry and not made available elsewhere. So a couple of things happened there. And this is the transition that we're in right now. The transition is to deleverage the economy and particularly the housing sector to mitigate the risk of a leverage-driven credit cycle bust. Now, most players in the property sector actually listened very carefully to the signals that were being sent by both the regulator and by the government at large, and they began to deleverage. Some enterprises, however, 
chose not to do that. And as they found it harder and harder to raise credit in the domestic market, they started to raise credit offshore. And that is what we see in the Evergrande situation for case in point. Evergrande could no longer raise credit domestically, and so it went offshore and raised credit via bonds into the global market. That's what happened. So the restructure that's going on, Jing Jing, is where we're reducing the claim that the residential property sector is having on national resources. We're transitioning the credit that was going into that sector into high-tech manufacturing, research and development and science in particular, as well as creating a raft of credit products and services for micro, small and medium enterprises. So that's the big change. We're also moving out of an economy that was focused on low labour cost manufacturing to a manufacturing sector that's driven on high value, high design, high technology driven products, such as EVs, PVs, and all the other things that are being manufactured. So in big picture terms, that's what's happening. Mm. So since Western media, Western commentators are so pessimistic about China's economy, I assume Western economies are doing great. Uh, I think that probably their real estate, their young generations are much more uh, have a much better future. Uh, US economy grew by 3.1% in 2023. China is 5.2% in 2023. Since they are so pessimistic about China's economy, how's, how's Western economy? Look, part of the narrative structure is um, to, in a sense, create some comfort at home. Um, so when the domestic economy actually has a whole range of challenges and problems there's a lot more comfort in saying don't worry because the other guys are going to collapse because part of the fear is that china will overtake america and uh, and provided that you can keep the population um, calm about the fact that in their narrative structure that china won't do that half of their sort of social stability battle i think is dealt with um, so it's about firstly just keeping people calm. But you can have narratives all day long, but narratives are not 100% of reality. Narratives create their own realities to some extent, but there is a reality that consistently ignores the narrative, right? And and the, And these realities are things like a commercial property crisis in America. That's a reality. It doesn't matter what the narrative is. This is actually a reality of low rental yields, high vacancy rates, and lenders who've lent money to commercial property projects who are facing a very, very high probability that they are going to have defaulting clients. That's a real problem. When you have... Uh, a situation where household mortgages, household credit card debts and student debts are rising, where delinquency rates are rising. Um, you know, these are real pressures and problems. It doesn't matter what the narrative is. At the end of the day, when households are under these kind of stresses, at some point, something breaks. And... The last few years in the American economic system, so to speak, those stress points have in a sense been masked over with an incredible amount of money just being pumped in. You know, print the money and pump it in and keep the system bubbling along. So the US economy has financialized stresses as a result of rising levels of household indebtedness. It has financial stresses around the commercial property sector. 
the IT industry in the United States has actually been retrenching people again in very, very significant numbers. And efforts to rejuvenate manufacturing through historically unprecedented government programs are having mixed successes. You know, so we see, for example, the attempt to build a new chip fab in Arizona with um, TSMC. And they're having all sorts of problems. <laughs> um, it's been delayed and the second plan's been delayed now to 2028. So creating new industries is actually very, very difficult. And China's experience tells us that. You don't suddenly magic up a complex manufacturing industry just because you throw money at it. It takes a lot of time and effort to harness resources, to build know-how, and to align and integrate diverse systems in complex environments. So the US economy has a whole range of risks and fragilities. Of course, everyone talks about the public debt as well, right? So, you know, it's got a rising public debt that's being used to finance this money circulation system. But the real economy is really not that robust. So that's one. Europe, on the other hand, is actually in a serious funk. Germany's in recession. The UK is in recession. I think Italy fell into recession as well. The Eurozone economies are projected to grow in 2024 by 0.9 of a percent. This is actually woeful. And it tells you how much economic headwinds there are in Europe in particular, but also in the transatlantic economies generally. Now, all of these economies interact a lot with China, just like most economies in the world. And the last thing either of those actually needs is for China to suddenly experience the collapse that some of them seem to wish to happen. So I don't think it's in their interest, number one, for any economies to collapse, uh, which always makes me wonder why this rhetoric happens. And one of the reasons for that, or why this narrative happens, is to manage you know, population dissent um, mm. in the domestic economy. Mm. So I think that's where you know, it's at. Yeah. You know, China is responsible for 35% of the world's manufacturing. America is 12%, I think. And also China's economy and China's technological achievement nowadays means that renewable energy uh, may become affordable because of the China's invested billions of, of, of yuan in renewable energies, in batteries, in, in electric vehicles. Uh, so, I mean, with that being said, I mean, that means if China's economy is collapsing, will collapse, as this Western commentator said, it will have unimaginable consequences on Western economies as well. So I think this Western commentator need to be careful what they wish for. If China's economy is collapsing, they will suffer the consequences as well. Yeah, look, I think we can actually be safe in the knowledge that China's economy won't collapse. And so they can also be comforted by that reality. So that's the difference between narrative and reality. Because on the other hand, there is the alternative reality coming from the Western mainstream commentator world, and that is that China's about to take over the world. Um, so you can't be collapsing and taking over the world at the same time. The truth is, is that China's not doing either, right? Um, reality is actually, in a sense, more complicated um, and, uh, and somewhere in between all of these things. Um, and so, you know, you look at, China's development into advanced and sophisticated manufacturers. And that's caused some concern in the last 12 months from European and American policymakers, politicians, and think tanks. And they basically run a couple of key lines. One is that China has overcapacity and therefore it's going to dump on the rest of the world. And that's bad and irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why China has overcapacity is that China invests too much 
in production, which is inefficient. So that's the first point. I'll come back to what that really looks like. The second point in parallel to that is the claim that Chinese consumption is weak. So all these extra things that China makes, the domestic economy doesn't absorb. So Chinese consumption is weak. And the evidence that's put on the table to try to substantiate this claim is China is going through an episode of deflation with price falling. The simplistic view about deflation is that deflation is a sign of shrinking aggregate demand in the economy. But that's not even textbook 101 stuff because even textbooks know that in de deflation can take place under many different kinds of circumstances and that in fact, research undertaken by researchers at the Bank of International Settlements of deflationary episodes in economic history over the last 140 years um, across 38 economies actually shows that deflation and collapsing aggregate demand is actually a very unusual combination when deflation happens. In fact, there's actually good deflation. And good deflation happens when supply is growing strongly as a result of technical improvements, technology, and productivity growth, and prices are being pushed down because of intensive competition. And all of this can happen whilst demand is growing strongly. Now, that set of circumstances actually fits the China story a lot better than the alternative story of bad deflation. Over the last 10 years, Chinese household consumption has grown significantly. Household incomes have more than doubled over the last 10, 12 years. In the last 12 months, household consumption has increased 9.2%. This is not an economy that doesn't have consumption growth. That's a nonsense. The other thing to remember is that household consumption as a percentage of GDP has also grown significantly in the last 16 years from a low point around the global financial crisis period of 2008, where consumption contributed about 55% of GDP to what it is today, which is about 69% of GDP. So consumption growth has actually been a feature of the last 12, 14 years. Household income growth has been a feature of the last 12, 14 years. And better than that, the, the standard measure of, of income inequality in a country, the Gini coefficient, has seen inequality reduce over the last 12 years. And the reason why that's important is that the mainstream narrative usually says something like, China's household consumption is weak, in part because the distribution of wealth is very uneven. So the last 12 years has seen rising household income, rising household consumption, rising household consumption as a percentage of GDP, reducing in income inequality, the domestic markets growing. And you actually see that in the data on the ratio between manufactured exports as a percentage of total manufacturing output. As I mentioned earlier, that has now dropped back to levels very similar to what they were 20 years ago. Different industries will be a little bit different, but overall, China exports about 13% of its manufactured outputs. 87% is actually consumed by the domestic economy. If you look at 
new energy vehicles. The growth has been in the last four years. Of course, we've seen massive growth in production. And the headlines always talk about China's growth as, as an exporter of vehicles, more than Japan and all those sorts of things. But the story that's actually not often told is that as China's production in new energy vehicles has expanded rapidly in the last few years, so has domestic consumption of them. And that over the last four years, Chinese domestic market has absorbed between 75% and 85% of output. In other words, China exports each year between 15 and 25% of what it produces. The domestic market is absorbing the vast majority of production growth in China. Right? So this the key threads of this narrative of overcapacity, underconsumption, deflation, actually misses the main game. And the main game is China's domestic markets actually growing. That's the first thing. And most of the production growth services the Chinese domestic market. The other thing that this common commentary often doesn't mention or it acknowledges it in a grudging and often a belittling way, is that it says, well, you know, China's exports into Europe and America is going to cause massive disruptions to Europe and America. And China's growth in its export capacity could never be absorbed by the developing world, could never be absorbed by the BRI countries and Africa and Central Asia and West Asia and Southeast Asia, because they're nowhere near as rich as the advanced G7 world. Now, we know over the last 15 years that China's growth in trade with all of these countries has grown faster than world trade growth as a whole. So they're catching up and there's an incredible window of economic development that's going to happen in these countries, which will create new markets. But not only that, the reason why they're going to grow Jingjing is because they're going to start to do the things that China used to do, like making labour intensive things that will create new industries in those countries. So they are now at a position where China was at say 30 years ago, and they will begin in their own way this modernization journey as China passes on the baton of labor intensive, low cost, high volume manufacturing to other nations to build their skills, to build their industries, to implement infrastructure. China will continue to develop its education so that it's got highly skilled, highly trained people it's going to develop and invest in its industries through science and technology and new tech and new tech and all those things. And we're going to see these transformations happen. Chinese vehicles occupy 8%. This is the new energy vehicles occupy 8% of the European market at the moment. 8%. It may grow to 15% in 2025 which means 85% of that market's actually served by manufacturers who aren't Chinese, right? What it seems to me is that it's not a problem of Chinese overcapacity. The world's growing. Um, the problem is, and particularly in Europe and America, is European and American undercapacity. They don't have enough of their own native manufacturing capability anymore. China's economy, Western economy, which will be the driving force in 2024? Well, in terms of driving force, the Chinese economy will be through sheer scale. Chinese economy, um, in terms of um, its size and its rate of growth, is going to be the driving force. You know, that's just a fact. Okay, thank you, Warwick. Thank you so much for your thorough explanation of China's economy, China's transition in English language so we can make 
people outside China to understand what is really going on. Why the Western commentators give such a pessimistic analysis of China's economy. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, and hope to have you more back on this show. Yeah, I look forward to it. That'd be great. Catch up with you soon. Hey, have you signed up to my weekly newsletter yet? I've created a weekly newsletter on Substack. If you prefer reading news, if you prefer reading news about China and other international pressing issues, if you want to look beyond the mainstream talking points, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. You will have your news delivered to your email. Do you want to be a content contributor as well? If you want to get your articles, your stories, your perspectives being published, let me know. Here is my email box, jjnewsletter at hotmail.com. Let me know. If you prefer watching short videos, you can find me on TikTok. My name on TikTok is I am Li Jingjing. If you prefer interacting, discussing with people from all over the world, you can find me on Reddit. My subreddit name is News with Jingjing. If you prefer watching long videos, you can always stay here on YouTube. And you know, I'm very active on Twitter as well, right? I will put the links of all my platforms in the description. I've been working as a journalist in China for more than 10 years now. I report stories related to China and also other international issues, but voices like mine are often being neglected, censored, or even attacked by Western mainstream media. I don't know, maybe one day, these Western companies probably want to erase me from their platforms. So it's very important that you subscribe me on multiple platforms so you can always find me. Thank you so much for supporting me for such a long time. See you next time.